Okay, so hopefully you are in the correct session for mastering your art shape by shape. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're an artist and already familiar with the level of sketch noting, this may be very basic for you because we're going to start right at the foundation and uh, let you walk away as, as a, a master artist, hopefully. Um, so I am a little bit technically challenged because I have a mic in one hand, my pencil in the other, and a new connection here. So bear with me if we have any technical issues. But let's get started. So um, my name is Shweta Mistry. Um, I'm coming in from New York. I work for Bloomberg. Um, and I've discovered over time um, that visualization and sketching is, is a very important component when we're, we're doing work at, in, in the agile space, um, whether it's a scrum coach, a scrum master, a participant, a developer. It becomes much easier as you visualize information. So, quick question for you. Stand up if you think you cannot draw. Okay, so hopefully we're gonna change this by the end, all right, so take a seat. So let's do a quick warm up. Um, in, open up your books and in the front of your page, um, divide your page into four sections. And remember, there's no perfection here. It's just whatever works for you. So just divide your page into four sections. And in one of your uh, 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 quadrants, um, you're going to just draw lines. So draw whatever kind of lines you think make sense to you. And hopefully this, is this showing up? Yes, perfect, okay. So in one quadrant, you're going to draw lines. In your other quadrant, you're going to draw circles. In the next one, you're going to draw triangles. And in the last one, any four-sided shape. So once you're done with that, I'm gonna have you turn to your neighbor. Um, so just make sure you've got someone to partner with. Um, and if you don't, then it's okay if you work in threes. Using just those four shapes, you're going to try and draw your neighbor. So draw your neighbor's face. Using just those four shapes. You will need to turn and look at them. Grab a notebook and you can sit with, at any table. You can grab a notebook if you need. Notebook, yeah. <laughs> it looks like we're going to have a double session here today. <laughs> Okay, who's done drawing their partner? Okay, it's all right. Are we able to lower the volume next to Okay, who's done drawing their partner? Okay, how does it look? Was it far from reality to a certain extent? <laughs> Find rabbit. I'm gonna leave a mic up front. Um, 
and then maybe we can hear everyone. I don't know if it's turned on, actually. Uh, sorry, yeah, Oh, okay. All right. Um, and then we can pass it around if we need to. So you were saying you look like a rabbit? I'm sorry. I, I was trying to design someone, but it ended up like being a very fine design rabbit. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick look at you, and I'm going to just use the four shapes. I'm going to see if I can draw you. Right. Now remember, this is not perfection, right? So if I use my circle, and as you can see, my circles are not perfect either. Here's a line because I see you're wearing glasses, a four-sided shape. I see you have a wonderful beard and a mustache. So there's my lines, and you have a lovely head of hair. So more lines there, and I'm going to draw very small circles in here, and maybe a line there for your nose, and I think I'm going to stop there. So not perfect, but it gives me an impression that you're very different from maybe the lady sitting next to you, right? So it gives you an idea that you can start somewhere, right? And you're starting with basic shapes. Let's just look at the history a little bit about why the simplification of drawing really works. So about 10,000 BC is as far as back as we're going, and I wouldn't be surprised if we find more research. We knew about cave paintings. So you realize that as humans, we were drawing before writing and probably reading as well, right? So visualization has been key and very ingrained in our autonomy for a very, very long time. So as much as it may be buried within us, it's somewhat natural to us. How many of you, whether you were in school or just like even when you're in meetings, end up doodling or, or just scratching on paper? Yeah, a few of you. I know I do it. Um, does it always make sense when you're done? No, sometimes it's just scribbles, right? So what your, your system is actually doing, it's helping you process information. Okay, so the science behind it is that our brain, okay, is really using a kind of a full, full use of the brain. So basically what that means is there's a connection with your hand. So anytime you're doing, you're doing a task that's related to your hand, it's a full brain task. And now when you're in a meeting or you're trying to focus on something and you're taking in that information, you're actually processing that as you start doodling. Okay, and there's a lot of research based on that, that the act of doodling is kind of a fine line in the border of daydreaming which also takes a lot of brain processing power and that actual processing of where you're trying to focus and concentrate. So it's actually quite healthy to doodle and, and sketch or write as you're, as you're learning information. How many of us are doing this a lot on text these days? Are we using uh, emoticons? Yeah? Do you typically use one or sometimes more than one? Just one? At the end, just one powerful one. Yeah, so what, sometimes it just takes one very succinct emotion. And sometimes you'll find you use a combination. Um, I know when I'm texting my family, I've got th uh, three nieces and nephews. So when I'm writing about them or I'm getting pictures of them, I'm usually like surprised and then a big smile and then like a really crazy smile. So there's just a ton of emotions that go into place. So you can see how you can bring your emotions into your, your sketching as well, right? And that's super important um, as well because anything that's tied to emotion your brain is more likely to remember more okay so here's our brain okay so like I was saying your brain is more likely to remember visual imagery because it provides a, bit, a full picture rather than processing the writing and and the reading concepts um, and it's a whole brain task so it's, it becomes much more important for our retaining information and long-term memory also, you'll find that if you are able to visualize um, a concept to your team or to um, somebody that you're talking to, it's much easier to hone in on the information that you're trying to um, ideate, okay? So, now we're going to really um, get uh, drawing, and we're going to start with very, very basic shapes. So, the purpose of, of this session is really we're going to start with basic shapes, tie them together, and see how they can actually end up um, in, in visualization. So... Your first shape that you start with, we started with some, but even if you step back before then, your dot is your most basic step. So the idea is that you're going to do this along with me, so you practice, the more you practice, the more it becomes natural. So feel free to get your hands um, and your pens on the paper and, and get creative. Um, I'm going to draw everything so you can follow me through if you need to, and then if you have any questions, we can clarify those as well. 
So you start with a dot that's your most basic, basic component, right? If you expand on those dots, you can end up with a dotted line, but then eventually form a line. So if, you're, if you really think that you're struggling with drawing um, a straight line, start with the dot on one end, another on the other, and then just connect the dots. It's your most basic, basic form. If we further use those lines, you can start forming shapes. So for any of you that may have struggled with that four-sided shape, you can easily form your larger shapes by connecting those lines. So your dots, your lines, and then your shapes are your most basic, basic formats, okay? If we move on, we start getting into circles and, and curvature. So if you are able to just draw an upside down, down U or a U the other way, essentially when you start combining the two, that becomes your circle. So if you're struggling with drawing the perfect circle, and again, remember, there's no perfect circle, start with two halves, and you then just eventually connect them. So then I'm just going to bring them closer, and that's your perfect circle. So I still struggle with these because, especially when I'm going quick and trying to draw faces, I usually just go, you know, uh, full-on circle, and then sometimes I have to slow myself down to go half and half, right? Um, one of the things that I find you will also uh, realize in your journey is it slows you down. It's like taking a breath, right? So as you're trying to get closer to drawing something more concise, paying more attention to it will give you a concise picture, even though you're working with very simple shapes. Um, if we were to stretch that, oops, I made a mistake there, but that's okay. Um, you could essentially draw two halves and create kind of a sideways oval or a long ways oval. So these are very useful sometimes when you're trying to draw expressions. It helps to kind of stretch the face or the circle in a certain direction. And then later on at some point, I'm sure you're going to use some kind of waves and you just continue the line, right? So they can be big, they can be small, they can be however you want, okay? Now, if we want to actually create something meaningful out of these shapes, because at this point, it's really like, you know, being in, in nursery school and, and just learning how to draw basic shapes. Let's start putting some of those pieces together, okay? So we started with the basic line. What if we want to draw an arrow, right? Simple. And these, a lot of these come naturally to us, right? But it's as we progress on these that we want to get more creative. So just adding more lines in a certain direction, okay, might get you going somewhere else. And they're very good for like emphasizing um, whether it's direction or um, something powerful. You'll find that you, you over time start building a vocabulary of um, uh, sketch noting components, let's call them, or graphical icons. Okay, so this is my thunderbolt and sometimes I'll just do like a really quick Z and then just double up on it. And then that way, um, you know, um, it becomes more impactful. And sometimes if I really want to make it impactful, I'll extend it and go in even further. All right. Um, we talked about drawing a four-sided shape, a square or a rectangle, and essentially how you extend it is what's gonna make the difference on what you're trying to, to create. So that's my tablet or, or phone. Um, and sometimes you'll notice, again, if you're going very quick, you're not thinking so much about positioning and things like that. So if I was to redraw that with a little more patience, I would probably put the inner square just a little bit higher and create more of a space here so that I have room to draw my dot and it looks a little more refined, okay? So that's the, you'll see quite a bit of a difference based on how quickly you go versus just pacing yourself a little bit. A flag is quite simple. Again, just squares and four-sided shapes, right? Quickly brings them together. And then if you want to start advancing from them, okay, if you wanted to draw a quick truck, again, another block, block two, block three, and then just throw in some circles, okay? Good with me so far? Yeah, all right, cool. Let's keep going. So let's look at triangles and circles, right? So how can we expand on that? So we started with the basic form of a triangle, okay? Here's our tree, it's Christmas, so we can definitely add some more components to it. We're getting close to Christmas, okay? And you can expand on the design. Here's a nice wedge of cheese, okay? Swiss cheese to be precise. 
Okay, so again, you can see basic shapes will form the um, entire component. And if we really wanted to draw a version of a boat as a half circle and a boat, slightly out of proportion, but if I paste myself, I'd probably make this bigger. And there we go. And then maybe even add a flag on it. Okay, so you can get as creative as you can. With the circle, for the most part, um, we're mainly using them for faces and expressions. Again, you can do two halves, or you can just draw the full circle. Um, you can start with your basic face, okay? And you'll notice the way you position your, your eyes, your mouth, your nose, and other components of the face, your expression will start forming, and we'll get into more detail there in a moment. Um, time is always an interesting one. So there's a few ways that um, I like to draw time. So if I get a bit more fancy with the hands, I can go this way and then just fill this in, or I can go with the basic shape that I already have up there. With things uh, like time or getting into some more detailed components where you're really trying to get a point across, it helps to pay attention to maybe one of the hands being longer and shorter than the other. Usually, I know when I was actually beginning and I used to start drawing the clock, I would draw the hands the same way because I was always trying to just make the lines the same way. Um, so it becomes easier if you start paying attention to some of those details. But again, you realize you don't have to get into too much detail, right? And then you can get creative with things like flowers and, and all sorts of other designs. Okay, so that's our basic um, triangle and circle. We talked about waves earlier. Okay, so this is where you can start playing with waves. So here was our basic wave. You can go small, you can go large, you can go tight, uh, you can go stretchy. Um, but these are really good to like express motion. So for instance, if I had a car here, let's just say, and I had a road, it helps show direction, right? So something like that is really good. Um, if I had an exhaust here, you know, it might be more focused if I had them tighter on showing the exhaust fumes. So just very basic variations will get you to um, expressing your um, drawing a little bit better. A cloud is quite simple as well. Again, big circles here. There's variations on clouds you can do. Again, curved lines is, is, is what you're going to need here. And you can do clouds. Um, if you want to add some rain, you can add some rain. Okay, so you can get creative again. If you want to show the sun coming out, Again, lines and circles, right? Add some expression, you've got a smiley sun back there, all right? Okay, um, the one that I've been practicing more with lately, because I like talking about neuroscience and neuroplasticity, is the brain. So I'm still work this is work in progress for me. So what I've discovered is if you, if you draw like a large cloud, okay, that's your, the, your major brain component, and then here's your brain stem. And that seems to work, and then you add your kind of squiggles in your brain, and that seems to work for the brain. Okay, so the brain is more of a complicated design, a more complicated concept, but yet using those simple components, breaking it down into smaller shapes, you can get to it. Um, this was one that I learned recently for a light bulb, um, UMZO, or UMZO, um, some people pronounce it. It's basically you're drawing a U, an M, oops, a Z, and there's your O. So that's a really quick light bulb, umzo. Okay, um, another, my original light bulb used to be something like this. Like I used to really try and get in on the details and I used to do something like this and then, you know, like a little flash around it. So that used to really like express what a light bulb going off, especially when you have it right above a person's head. It's great for ideating. Okay, everyone good with basic shapes so far? Any questions, thoughts on that? Yeah? Okay, so the one bit of advice I'll give you right there is just play around with this. Sometimes you're just like focusing on drawing lines and you'll start forming shapes and they come together and you're like, oh, you know what? That really looks like a cloud or that really looks like something that, you know, I've been trying to draw for a while. Again, remember, it's, it's helping process um, your ideation, right? So it's, there's a lot of cognitive processing going on with the whole hand and uh, brain connection going on there. So let's start talking people and figures. Was there a question? Uh, yeah. The question. Um, uh, thing is, w when, I, uh, when I draw a line, uh, um, when I draw it like fast, it looks good. Yeah. But then when I try to concentrate and make it right, it's not right anymore. Uh, yeah. 
because it's only me? No, I, I think so. I think you go through variations of that, and I think sometimes it depends on the task on hand, right? If you think about the processing connection when you're cognitive processing, right, and you're not paying attention to it, like when you're in a meeting and you're just drawing, you're probably going at, at quite a steady, fast pace, right? You're just like, okay, whatever. Those things are probably linking to whatever information you are processing at that moment um, and is more likely to come naturally. So whether your intention is to come out straight or not, that's going to vary. Now, often I've seen that if I've been practicing for a while or I've been drawing for a while, if I go quickly, it comes out more naturally and it's much more straighter. I think it really comes down to a warm-up, right? How's, what was the time difference between when you last drew to now? So your hand has had the practice and your brain is already in that mode for processing, right? Um, when I focus more, like you saw, I, I, I wasn't 100% straight or, or anything like that in the beginning, right? So, because I was warming up now, as I'm going through the pages, I'm, I'm getting much more comfortable, you know, just automatically, I'm not thinking about it so much. So, to me, at least in my experience, I've seen that it's been more of a warm-up process and really just getting down pen to paper. And pen to paper really is, like, key. Um, before I picked up the, um, the stylus and the iPad, like, it was really for me getting on pen and paper, being okay with making mistakes. Mistakes. I mean, with technology, you can do undo quite a bit, so it's quite easy, right? And especially when you're doing presentations. But be okay with making the mistakes. Um, part of what I used to do is when I made a mistake, I, I, for, for a certain amount of time, I made a rule with myself that I wasn't going to erase it. I would expand it into something else, right? So get comfortable with making those mistakes as well. Obviously, when I'm doing a presentation, I'll, I'll go back and forth sometimes just to get the concept across. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. All right. Cool. So, people and figures. Um, as children, we probably started out with the most basic uh, figures, stick people, right? Everyone familiar with, with drawing stick people? Yeah? What I found over time was it's quite interesting how you can add expression and movement and, and quite a bit of activity to stick people, which I was never very good at. Um, so, a basic stick person obviously starts like that. So, again, straight lines and circles. Right, that's all it comes down to. If you want to add some feet, you can add like a little base there and some structure, right? So now you start forming um, more of um, a solid component there. Um, how you lengthen your different lines um, or shorten them is going to also make an impact on how you perceive a person or the stick figure, okay? So you can make them taller, you can make them shorter, shorter legs, shorter arms. Um, what I've noticed makes these work really, really well is when you're struggling with drawing the right kind of um, stick person or any kind of figure, think back to how your body moves, right? So initially I used to really struggle with the direction our joints go in, so whether it's your elbows or your knees, right? And I would really get this guy wrong, okay? So this guy here, sorry, this guy here, um, initially I used to go something like this to get them running and my legs were all over the place. So the way that I found to really get the direction and the movement right is pay attention to how your body moves. So like even when I'm sitting, I'll just be like, oh, if I move, I'm gonna go like this. So I know my elbow and my legs are gonna go in a certain direction, right? So that way I get my joints right. Otherwise it looks really kind of funny, right? And then you've got all the joints. So I, I like to focus more on the major joints, right? So your elbows, your wrists, your knees, your ankles, right? Those, like, if you can get just that far, which really are your, your key joints, right? Those get you with a lot of um, direction and movement. Um, similarly, this one was very challenging for me when I first started, um, the sitting pose. Um, my sister uh, um, uh, recently became a, a yoga instructor, so I was like, well, how can I show a sketch that portrays her? So I was like, she's always in meditation pose. So, you know, here's kind of the thighs, and then you bring in here, but then you also want to kind of consider the knees here, right? Because your knees are going to kind of uh, fold back. So that part was initially challenging for me, but then if I just extended it out and made sure that my, my feet were coming outwards as opposed to inwards, that made a difference for me. And then this was also hard because initially I used to just put straight arm just like as if I'm sitting like this, but then it didn't seem to give enough of an expression of the fact that I'm in meditation pose, right? So I was like, how do I then bring in the elbows, right? So then I used to like just put a slight bend in, make sure connected with the knee and then put the little hand there. And at this point, even this doesn't look very right, but sometimes it's just in the angling, right? So 
you, you get to play around with some of those things. But, you know, pay attention to, like, major joints and, and kind of direction of your neck and things like that, because that will help set expression. So you could do the same thing with kind of the extended parts of your body, but your body itself, you can have different versions of that. So your stick figure, again, being the most basic. But then, you know, how do you start adding more components? to your uh, person, right? So this is a very long arm person, right? But I might want to start, you know, saying, um, well, how many of you are doing Scrum, for instance? In Agile, yeah? So product owner, Scrum master, uh, your dev team, those are your key roles, right? So typically for my product owner, I'll give them a collar. Because for, for whatever reason, sometimes your product owner comes more businessy and, and like, you know, comes off more like, you know, they might be wearing a suit and a tie. Or maybe if it was, you know, a female product owner, um, I'll give them like, you know, a necklace or something like that. Um, one of the things that you're going to find um, as you do more sketching is a key component that helps... Um, the idea come across is writing what it is under the sketch. So the visualization component is there, but sometimes if it becomes, starts to become unclear on what it is, just, put, uh, just write underneath it. Writing the actual name of the piece that you're drawing or the component that you're drawing really helps further kind of um, with the visualization and the concept drawing of, of the different things that you're trying to do. And similarly, we, um, you know, we've got the same figures here, but we can see that you can clearly draw the same kind of figures, even with like a, a box body or, or um, a stick figure. Other types of bodies that you can also draw are the, what I like to call the upside down U, which is simply this, right? So circle and an upside down U. Um, a slight variation on that um, that you might want to do is kind of give it a, a little bit of a dip for the neck and then come around. Um, that kind of gives more of an emphasis that there is a neck there, right? And then um, when, you, when you start adding facial expressions, it kind of helps with direction a lot more. So you're not actually drawing in the neck, which you, I guess you potentially could do, but for whatever reason, it doesn't come across as well as the gap, right? The gap seems to look better for some reason. So, uh, you know, mentally we just know that a neck exists there, so our brain can already fill in that gap for us. Um, if you're um, lo looking to draw teams, um, you're probably, actually let me do this the other way. This is a really easy way. Just keep going M, M, M or upside down U, U, U. And it's a good way or a quick way to draw teams, right? And if it's not obvious, you can put team underneath it. Or the way I like to do it is I put team on four figures. Okay, and it's just like very impactful to just kind of see that um, when, when you're trying to get a point across. Um, obviously, if you want to put some distance in there, you can create um, the illusion of a conversation by just placing that much distance between the two that you can show it's two separate groups and they're talking to each other or, or you know, communicating or something like that. Um, the other guy that I have here or person is the bean person. And that is basically, it's a rounder figure Okay, same with the arms and legs. But again, this gives you more, um, more kind of, um, of, a, of, a, of a physical uh, component to it, I think. Um, and um, you can provide more expression. And again, you can do the same things with providing a collar, you know, um, providing... Actually, this is one of my favorites, the Scrum Master, so I like to draw cape, okay? And then I will put on there, like, they've got sometimes, you know, if I have more space, I'll do, like, the Superman belt on them. And then they get the Scrum Master kind of like, oh, yeah, hero, the hero coming in to save the day. Um, and then you can keep going with the different forms of expression there as well. Okay. There's one more that I'm going to talk to you about. And this is the star person. This one I personally find still a little bit more complicated. Um, I've st I'm still finding it a little more limiting as well with what I can do with it, more so because with the stick figures, you can pay more attention to the joints and provide more expression and direction and physical movement. With these, I'm still struggling with what I can do with their body parts, so to speak. So the star person is literally, you're saying that the top point becomes the head and the rest of it is the body, right? So you can either start with the circle and then build out, build out the arms and legs, or the other way around, you can start out with the person's 
body and then um, drawing the head. Now, I don't know if you noticed as I draw that, um, when I started with the head, my body became kind of rounder and broader. And when I started with the star, it, became, it seems to become more slimmer. So I think also the order of components that you draw will then impact the following components. So for whatever reason, knowing in my head that I was trying to draw a person, even though I was trying to draw a star, I, 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 somewhere in my brain, I processed it as a longer figure to make it look more like a person. But before, because I already had the, um, the head to start with, I followed the head and the other piece came in to kind of fit the head shape a little bit more. So you'll find these little tricks and kind of test yourself as well on how you're drawing and then see if it's really making the impact that you intend to. Okay, good so far? Yeah, okay, so let's take a look at um, facial expressions because that's where it starts getting a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to give you maybe about, let's say seven minutes. Um, and I've put some different expressions here. You can experiment with the ones that you want to do. Take a moment to um, partner up and see if you can come up with these expressions and what they look like. Now, a hint that I would give you is if you're struggling, like let's say you're struggling with shocked. Have your partner make a shocked face, okay? And then just kind of focus on where their eyebrows are, where their mouth moves, okay? And if anything else kind of stands out for you. All right? So I'll give you about seven minutes. If you finish up early, we'll, we'll, cu we'll cut the time box. But um, let's start there and see how you guys get along. Um, I've got nine different ones. So see if you can get as many of these or some different ones for yourselves. All right?
Don't forget, if you're getting stuck, make faces. Okay, let's uh, bring it back. How many of you were able to do more than nine expressions? Did you find it hard to, to come up with the nine? Yeah. It, was, it was challenging. Did you practice making faces? Either at each other or yourself? Yeah? Okay, I'll show you the technique in a, in a bit um, to make that a little bit easier. It is initially challenging just to think, okay, what does my face look like or what does the other person's face look like and say, I want to draw a shocked expression or an angry expression. Uh, the reason being is there's a lot going on on our faces. Okay, so as, as much as we might be focusing just on eyebrows, you know, how our mouth lifts up and things like that, there's a lot of micro expressions going on which are hard to capture if we just go straight in and say, okay, I'm going to try and draw this, this face. Um, that's a lot of the reasons why we typically stop drawing because we're trying to aim for perfection and we realize that it's really, really hard to get to it. And that's why I'm, I'm just going to keep repeating, bring it back to the basic shapes, okay? So I'll run you through a couple more things before I bring you back to how you can uh, build out some um, different expressions in a really simple way. But I wanted to just show you. So you probably ended up with a few different expressions at least. And these are some of the more basic ones that you would come up with, okay? Um, but how do you add more character to that, right? And what I want you to think about is simply layers, okay? So, 
the same faces, so these are the exact same faces I had on this previous slide, and I've just added layers to them and been able to build out very, very different characters. So whatever you do, okay, um, your, your basic central um, component is going to remain the same, but whatever you add to it is what's going to make it different and add character. Okay, let's say we're, we're making a king here, right? You can really like create um, different expressions um, depending on what you're adding to the same basic component. Okay, um, so practice with building on your your basic faces uh, when, whenever you get a chance to to build out the characters that you want. Um, similarly, um, you can you know different um, expressions combined with um, different expressions like for this this particular person you know I've added quite quite some details around their glasses and and you can easily probably tell that this might be if you had to um, say what kind of character that, that is what would you say that is a teacher anything else nanny, nanny okay. Librarian comes to my mind for whatever reason. So those are particularly like spot on, right? So you can see how very quickly you can add specific characterizations to um, to the same kind of basic component, but by just adding some very simple um, add-ons to it. So layers is what I want you to think about. But let's come back to the expressions. So I want you to draw um, a grid like this on one of your pages, um, and it's literally six lines down and six lines across, and form a grid. And so a really easy way to form all those different expressions using basic components is if you use something like this as a grid and then they start building out kind of your visual vocabulary is, is what I like to call it. So on the top um, grid here, I'm going to add some eyes. Um, again, it doesn't need to be perfect, just different kinds of eyes. And you can make these grids as large or as small as, as, as you like. Do that one again. And maybe that. OK. So that's your top row, just some eyes. On the first row going down, I'm going to have you draw some mouths. Now, whether they look like mouths at this point, I don't know, but we'll see what comes together. So this is your very basic, basic grid. Eyes and mouths are the, are the key components that, that form the, the um, uh, expressions. So what you're going to start doing is filling out your grid, and you're just cross-referencing each one. So these are the eyes I have in this column, kind of, sort of. And that's the math I have. In this one, I have this one. And then, again, doesn't need to be perfect, but this is how you fill out the grid. OK? So already you can see I've got five very distinct expressions right there. And then similarly, if you continue down the line, you're going to cre keep creating more expressions. OK, so take a moment and just fill out the rest of your grid. I'll give you about five more minutes to fill out the rest before we iterate on this.
How's everyone doing? Good with the grid? Okay, so you can see very quickly, you're able to create 25 expressions right there. Very, very quickly. Now, what if you want to expand on this a little bit more, okay? Um, again, you could take the exact same set and, and do another one to get every combination possible. Um, but if you just wanted to grow this particular grid, um, something that, that really provides a lot of key expression is your eyebrows, okay? So if I was to add eyebrows here, right? you might get very different expressions now if you were to fill out the grid, right? So again, this is how you grow more expressions. And now it probably becomes a lot more easier to say whether you have shocked, angry, some of those more um, like micro expressions that we were talking about earlier that were hard to capture when you're just looking at someone's face. Right, so if I add some here. Okay. And so forth. And again, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, you'll get better at it as you keep practicing. This is also a really cool uh, team building exercise. So if you're having one of those tough retrospectives and you want to kind of warm up the room, like get your teams kind of loosening up and talking to each other, it's a fun exercise just to, you know, maybe talk about how did the sprint go this time? You know, can you draw the expressions that you went through? Something like that, or even just have them go through an exercise like this. So let me add one last piece to this. So we've got eyes, eyebrows, and mouth. What other components do you think might make a difference to the way the expressions come across? Any ideas? Right in the middle of your face, your nose, okay? So if I add that to this side, you can see a nose can start adding a really varied component to your expressions. And it almost makes the face come really alive. Okay, what if you don't want to draw a face? So it's still quite easy to express expression without actually drawing the features. But this time you're going to have to focus more on the physical body, right? Um, and then you might add additional components to express the idea that you're trying to get the expression across, right? So if, for example, this one, I've got a question mark because really this person is saying, what's up? Like, I don't know, right? Additionally, you might add like the light bulb here, right? For ideation. So like you can see the difference that it could be an idea or it could be a question mark. So two ideas right there. But the positioning of the face, the shape of the face, the arms and legs, that's what's going to matter here. You can also see um, right here, I've got the shoulder lifted up just a little bit, just saying, yeah, you know, I don't know what, right? So things like that. This particular one that's trying to lift some weights, we know this guy's probably like sweating a little bit, right? 
you know, their knees may be a little weak. Right, so they might be shaking as, as they're kind of trying to lift those weights up. Um, uh, there's, there's probably a few other things you can add there. This person, what would you say this expression is, this last person? Sad. Sad, depressed, thinking, um, there could be many of it. So sometimes when, when you've got a figure like this or even any other component, and if it's not 100% clear on what the idea is, and you think it may still be questioned, add the word, right? Just literally adding the word can make the difference. And you've still got a good visual to instantly make that connection, but you're also then putting in the word to really clarify that you're not talking about sadness this time, you're talking about depression or, or vice versa, right? Um, so things like that. But you can clearly see you don't need to have a facial expression to be able to actually express the emotion that you're going to try to um, get across. And emotions are really, really hard, um, especially when you're trying to simplify them because our face has like millions of different muscles and things moving um, uh, uh, you know, below them to get these um, expressions across. So to try and break them down in a very simple manner is quite challenging, and that's why the facial grid, super, super easy, super, super important, and much more easier to name the visual rather than doing it the other way around, right, as we saw earlier. Okay, so that's everything I've got for peoples and expressions um, for you. Um, what I'd like to talk about now is signage, right? So banners, containers, frames, right? How do you make things really pop out, stick out um, when you're trying to get ideas across? So banners are very, very um, common, um, but there are also very different ways of drawing them and many ways and, and forms of drawing them. So let's start with one of the simpler banners and literally, that in itself is a banner, right? You could put whatever you want. Now, I'm still gonna X that out because what I'm gonna say is before you draw your banner, you wanna put your word in there. And the reason why, so let's say we're saying agile, write your word because it's very easy to try and fit in agile in here afterwards and it may or may not fit. So write the word first, then draw your component around it. Okay, so it ensures that it fits. So at, that's your most basic banner that you could have. But now if we want to make it a little bit more fancy, um, this particular one that I've got here, right, there's a few things that make it kind of stand out um, more than um, it would if you just kind of went in and drew it. So the first thing you want to do is just look at the gaps here, okay, a little bit lower because it shows that depth. So start a little bit lower, but make sure this width or height is the same, okay? So you keep that the same. You're also gonna bring this in a little bit. And to show that kind of fold, you come straight down here, tighten it up there, and just add some depth there. That shows you the fold. So let me do that again on this side. Okay, it's same height, it's a little bit lower. Oops. And you're going to go straight down there. It's kind of like a triangle here, and you just color it in for depth. Okay, that gives like that impression of a fold and then you can finish it off however you want okay whether it's it's nice and clean or um, jagged like a tear however you want now if you want to continue doing the same thing and make it like an expanded banner you just add on to it so this was our initial okay coming in lower okay and now if I just want to expand it more, all I'm going to do is the same thing and just make it longer and longer. Okay, and then I typically go back in and, and then finish in the, the depth part. It, for, for whatever reason, it makes it easier for me to just go back and fill in. And again, you'll find your own technique and ways of walking through the steps, okay? Um, what's the one mistake I made here before I actually drew my banner? Didn't write the words. I didn't write the words, exactly, right? So um, I should have written the word first to ensure that my uh, um, word fits, okay? Um, and that's why instead of saying Agile Paris, I switched it to Paris, okay? So sometimes on the fl if you're doing this on the fly and you make a mistake like that, it's okay, but you'll find little ways of tweaking it as long as you realize um, um, the harder thing would have been if I went in and tried to fit in Agile Paris in the whole thing, then I would have been in trouble, okay? 
Um, there are some different banners as well that you can do. Um, again, very basic components, a squiggly line, okay? When you're doing banners, it's quite important to make sure that they're parallel, so the distance is what you're emphasizing here. Just ensure that your distance is, is quite equal. Again, if it's not perfect, it's not going to matter, okay? And then this is just like a scroll banner, and it's just another curl on the end, and then you just attach it, and it just looks like it was a scroll, okay? Um, if I was to break this one down, again, it's just a very simple line, straight down, and actually I made the mistake of making this one a little bit longer, so I'm gonna make this one longer to match up, and see, you can see the difference right there, me rushing versus me actually paying attention there, okay? Um, that's, that's what's gonna make some of the difference, especially when you're trying to do this more formally. Um, you see some of those live artists and, and sketch artists, you know, who can do the full conference. I can't do that. But um, they're probably paying a lot more attention to how their, their joins and, and connections are coming out better. Um, and then you're just basically going backwards here to just show that the, um, the ribbon or the banner is coming around. We can end it up. And then again, these two lines being parallel and equidistant. Okay, so you might want to start with the actual lines first and then fill in... Um, the end piece to it, okay? Um, these ones get interesting over here. So if you're thinking of putting tape or something like that over a banner, which component do you think you need to draw first? I, sorry, I, I, tape. tape, exactly, right? Because you can always draw the square and then the tape on it, but then you're gonna have lines to erase. So, some, so the order does matter as you start making the um, image a little more complicated. So start with the tape first, and then create the actual banner. And again, in this particular case, you would start with the word first, right? If, if we were actually, and I can't spell right now. There you go. Okay, so this does get a little more complicated because even though once I've got the word, I can't actually put the box around it because I still need to draw my tape. Okay, but the one thing you can do is position your tape equidistance from each end, and then you can draw in your box. Okay, and that way it's much more cleaner, much more concise and impactful. Uh, these are a few I had done before, so it's the same examples, but as you can see, this is one that I actually really paid attention to, so I spaced it out nicely. I added, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, something to make it a little more impactful. Um, you know, the scroll is colored in, um, you know, the scroll here. You know, I try to match the font here. So you can get creative with how you do it. You know, there's no, no particular precise or perfect way to do it. Okay. Let's talk about containers a little bit. Containers, again, are anything that's going to hold some words for you or some concept for you, right? Um, kind of aligned uh, around the, uh, the lines of the banner as well. You could literally have any kind of container that, that helps you make an expression, right? So something like, you know, wow, okay? Um, and as you can clearly see, I'm still practicing very hard putting in the words first before drawing my containers, because you see that, that we're very attuned to writing first. So for me, that's still a challenge. So what I really should have done is write the word to make sure it fits, and then have drawn around it, okay? And that way I'm guaranteed that word is gonna fit in there, and I don't need to do any erasing. Um, words and containers are very, very good to kind of help express exactly what it is you're trying to do. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing the word square, okay, and I did this, that, that might not be as impactful as if I did this. And obviously it should really be a square, not a rectangle. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I got the, the component to actually match the, um, the wording that I'm trying to do. Uh, similarly with kind of bubbles that you can do um, above people or just kind of on their own, right, are quite easy to do. And again, I didn't put the word in there, but you can do so like that or write the word in first and then draw your bubble around it. You can modify speech bubbles a little bit to give a slightly different concept, right? So speech, when you think about it, is kind of more concise. You know, once the words have left your mouth, they can't come back, okay? But when you're thinking, it's more of a bubble, it's more of a cloud, right? There's a little room for movement. So that's why we make it more of a cloud. 
okay? And that's exactly what we do. Okay, and if we have that above a, a person or a stick person, it's quite impactful. Um, idea, I like to give the bubbles just because I think it's still in your head. Um, but sometimes for an idea, okay, um, I will draw a light bulb and then I'll have the person above it, okay, because they're still thinking. And you can always, like, you know, add more expression to it to make it more impactful, okay? Um, sometimes you may want to show conversation, okay? So if I had two people having a discussion and I wanted them to, you know, come, in, come to a conclusion, okay? You can make joint conversations as well, right? So you can bring in conversations, you can overlap them, there's several ways of doing that. So you can do the multiple speech bubbles. You can do kind of a jigsaw effect like I have here. And see, this, this is one of the, one of the um, problems when you're going fast and not thinking it through. So I drew the jigsaw piece without drawing this piece, and now I have something to erase. Okay, so that's, that's kind of when you're getting more complicated, you just pay more attention to the piece that you're drawing. And then on the fly, you'll also notice that from the original square that I had like this, I ended up going straight into speech bubble mode and started drawing it circular. So, I'm, uh, you know, that could have potentially have been another error. But I caught myself early enough to catch the kind of pointed piece here to make the speech part complete. And it's okay. It still works, right? Um, and then you can add, add your people here or vice versa. You can do the people first and, and the speech bubble uh, next or... Um, the other way around. It really just depends on how much space you have to move around, um, your positioning, um, and the impact you're trying to make. Sometimes it will really matter, and sometimes it really doesn't, okay? Um, color is also always good to kind of help separate things. So this particular version here, I've kind of, um, you know, created some different versions with color. Um, this one, I've kind of tried to show that they're coming to a consensus here by doing the blue and yellow, making it green. Okay, so you can add little bits and pieces to it to enhance your message and get more creative, okay? Um, some other containers that we might want to get into, okay, are um, if you have, so tape we already talked about, this, this particular one has tape on the sides, but same concept, you draw the tape first and then you draw the box around it, but you might have like posters and frames, so this one is okay if you draw the, the box um, before the pins, so this is kind of if you have a push pin. It's really just an angular line with a dot on it. And these are quite large push pins, but you can obviously make them smaller. You can make the push pins so they really look, you know, fancy. And, you know, add more expression to it that way. So again, you can build on it as much as you want. Um, if you're drawing a frame, Again, keep in mind with all these uh, frames and containers, you would be putting the word in first, right? I'm just not doing it um, to keep going at this point. But the frame itself is just, you know, a square or rectangle inside of itself. And then you just connect the corners. And then that's quite impactful as well. You know, if I was going to turn that into a picture frame, there's my push pin, there's two more lines, and then I could draw a pretty picture. Okay, picture frame, quite impactful there. So other types of containers, um, let's see which ones we didn't cover. So we covered the tape, um, this is the, the frame, we covered a banner, we covered this banner. Uh, these two are basically the same kind of very simple frames, but instead of a push pin or tape, I've just added screws. Um, what I try to make sure when I'm, when I'm adding screws is the diagonal line that, or, or even if it's the Phillips, if that's our preference. Um, just make sure the angles are a little bit different so they're not exactly the same, okay? Because that kind of shows that it's more of a natural fit and it's just not, you know, something that's been kind of photocopied. Um, and then similarly, you would just, um, if you were just kind of uh, envisioning nails, just dots are pretty good enough, okay? Bullet points are quite common, right? So you can make those a little more impactful by literally just solidifying what you would typically have. 
okay? And that makes it more visually appealing. Um, if you have check boxes or something like that, okay, um, you can do that. Uh, this particular one, I've just added block shading. So this might be a nice one if, for instance, you were doing some kind of visual presentation or ideation and you wanted to, as you're talking, go through the boxes and just check them off, okay? Here's some more example of bullets. So again, you can be creative. They might be around a theme. You know, um, you could put Christmas trees, you could put hearts, like whatever your, your idea is at that point, you can, you can um, be creative. Okay, let's go through some arrows. Okay, we did a few earlier, but basically what you want to do is you start with your basic arrow, okay? May or may not touch here, but then you start building on it, right? So solidifying it, duplicating it. This one's really just um, a duplicate or kind of mirror image of it, and then you connect it, okay? And then obviously arrows can show direction in a certain way. Okay, and get some concepts across. You can also do, actually, sorry, I skipped one here. Um, so these kind of more like feather-like arrows are really cool if you're trying to do something like a target. Right, so if that was my target and I drew this first arrow, it's kind of really impactful if I draw it like a real arrow. Right, but again, you can see very simple shapes, a bunch of circles, a couple of triangles, and a very simple arrow, okay? I might want to end it up there. You can also do something similar with the more solid type. And again, you won't always get it right. I just made a mistake here. Right? If it was more angular, like this particular one, it would have been much more appealing. But th these are the kind of mistakes you're going to make, and that's completely okay. It's just catch yourself, redraw it, and correct yourself, right, and pay attention to it. Again, if I was going slower, I probably would be catching it better. So um, th I think that's part of the fine balance of how well do you want to do it. If you're really trying to get good at this, you will need to pace yourself, practice a little bit more. Um, otherwise, if you're just trying to get quick ideas across, it's okay. You know, the simple mistakes like that are not going to matter so much. Um, you can also expand your arrows into kind of signposts. So again, you would put the text in first and just write around it, right? Okay. Uh, you may want to even expand on that and give it more direction, and that's completely fine. Um, doing something like a signpost, again, you know, any pieces that you're going to hide, like the, you know, the, the actual uh, post here would be on top of the, the pillar that would be um, hammered into the ground. You just want to make sure your layers make sense, right? So in this particular case, if I did this, and then try to draw my banners, that probably isn't gonna make sense, right? So those are the kind of things you wanna just kind of think about a little bit before you start putting pen to paper, is it makes more sense to do this first and then draw the actual post around it, right? Okay. some variations on uh, posts here. Um, we can make them very, very simple. Okay, you don't need to make them um, very large or anything like that, but then you can always, you know, build on them and make them bigger if you think you have more time or if you want to add more expression to them. Okay, similar with the stop sign, you know, if I wanted to do it really quick, that's enough. Okay, but then if I find I have time, I can definitely make it much better and um, give it more emphasis, okay? And with the grass, um, I always like um, adding like little bits of grass, which is really just squiggles in different directions. Very, very simple, okay? But it, that actually is also gives you some depth as well, and it kind of gives you more of a, a 3D view. Let's talk about text. So, um, 
if you're trying to visualize something, you would think you're probably not going to write much, but there is a lot of power in emphasizing your text as well, right? So there's three com typical components to the actual uh, writing of text. Um, there's the component that's called your ascender, which is kind of the piece be before the, um, the core body of the text. Then there is the body, which is that central piece. And your descender is, let's say you were writing a G, and I'll draw a really thin one here. Okay, and it's very badly written actually, but this would be your descender right here. Okay, so it's the pieces that go be below the body with like the G's, the Y's, and things like that. Um, you can get as expressive as you want with your text. They will also help emphasize a concept. Okay, so the way you letter um, is, is quite impactful as well. Okay, so as you can clearly see, I went small here, went big here. Block is just literally you take the, the regular letters and you just kind of make them thicker. It's the same letter, but okay. Um, and you can uh, give it more emphasis. Tall is just literally regular letters, just stretching them out, right? Just making them really tall and skinny. Okay, that gives it that concept. Wide is stretching them out the other way, right? So just really making them kind of shorter and, and thicker. Bubble is similar to blocks, but you're just making it a little more curvier, right? Just think of bubbles, right? And that's kind of how you're forming your letters as well. So it's more rounded. You know, fancy could be whatever your version of fancy is. Um, I find cursive um, and kind of just extending out the lines to be more fancy. And then cute could be where you're either coloring it in or, you know, um, however you want to. This could, cute could actually even be funny the way I've, I've drawn it here, in, in my opinion. But, you know, you can get as creative as you want. Completely up to you, right? It's your expression at the end of the day, but you want to make an impact. So ultimately, I say have fun, okay? Uh, just play around with it. See what works for you. See how people um, perceive uh, whatever you put out there. Ask for feedback. It's always uh, useful to just ask people like, you know, did that make the impact that I intended? Because this is what I was trying to do. Or just say, hey, what did you think? Right? And see if it did make the impact for them and, and gather that feedback. Um, the last little bit I want to just talk to you about um, before we wrap up is shade. So shade, there's um, one key concept that I learned quite recently that I felt like changed my life. Uh, when it came to shading, because I really never was sure where to shade. Um, and it's just very important to know where your light source is. So whether, think about a lamp, think about the sun, right? Um, so whatever direction that light source is coming in, you want the shade to be on the opposite side. All right, so if I had, let's say, um, the letter A, okay, and my light source is coming in here, okay, basically, um, you start a little bit lower just to show that depth again, and you just come around, and that's the side that shade is going to be on, okay? Because that's exactly how shadows fall. And you can do the same thing on this side as well. And this you might have to play around with a little bit because sometimes it's, it's easy enough to kind of end up in the wrong place. Um, and see for here, I would, I would go here, but then somebody might argue that it essentially belongs here, right? which is probably actually the right place, but for me, um, it just made sense to go the other way. And that's okay, again, you'll play around with it. So for shade, um, you're going to just uh, you know, experiment with that, but just f keep in mind where that light source is. That will really help guide you. Uh, shade can also show different um, kind of parts of um, a physical component. So for instance, up here, we've got depth, right? Um, and you can uh, layer that in different ways as well. So if I was going to draw that again, Okay, um, the angling is quite important, you know, to show the, de uh, the depth, but you might find that you're gonna crosshatch it instead, right? And that's still a level of shading and it still shows depth. Uh, you might find that you will dot it, right? And that's just fine as well, right? Still shows depth, still shows that your light source is coming in that way, okay? Um, there's depth on this person, so sometimes you'll find that it makes more sense to add the depth on the inner side. So again, this doesn't quite stick to the light source rule, but the side of where your light source is is still falling correct for the shadow, but this is more to show depth, so, so the shadow is falling more forward. Um, you can add shade to show 
movement even, right? So if this is the ground, and let's say I have a car here, right? It's quite easy to see that this is a stationary car. But what if I want to show movement? I just lift up the car, maybe add some movement there, and now it's on its way, right? It's moving forward, propelling forward. So um, probably would have been better if I actually attached it to the wheels. Um, but you know, as you can see, like it's very easy to correct mistakes. You know, I just made this a really nice, uh, fancier car. Okay, so, um, but it's off the ground and it's moving forward. We're showing some speed and things like that. Okay, um, you can put it all together. So basic shapes, just think back to basic, basic components, basic shapes. That's really what's gonna get you to some of the more creative um, images and visuals that you'll see. Um, my favorite is Google the icons that you're interested in drawing, right? So if there's a particular concept you have in mind and you're struggling with how to draw it, just type in chart icon or table icon. Um, they come up with a ton of those, you know, kind of black and white images or kind of sketched images um, that you are trying to uh, draw and it becomes very easy to try and duplicate those, right? But just still think back to basic shapes. How can you build it out of basic shapes and basic components? So lines, triangles, circles, rectangles, all of those things will help bring them all together. And that's really what in all of these, you know, this one, this is just lines. These are kind of extended dots. Um, and then it really is just lines and dots in this, this particular one. And you can see how you can uh, make an impactful uh, image there. This is the one I showed you earlier about a target. It's just a bunch of circles. Um, not quite, you know, I'm rushing through it clearly. So not quite um, as perfect as it could be. But there's my arrow. And again, just really simple. Um, with the table one, what I've done here is I had to think about this a little bit more about where I was placing my people, right? Because I, w I needed to make sure that some of the people were gonna get covered up here and then some were not, right? So this person's not covered up. So for that, I started out with these two people up in the front because they're in the foreground, right? So I wanted to make sure they didn't get covered up. Okay, drew them in and then I ended up just drawing a circle for the table, okay? And now I can place everyone else around it however I want to position them. But now it's just more of a perception of depth. Okay, and then, you know, they can have a bunch of post-its on the table and some pens, right? Perfect retrospective. Okay, so you can get creative, you can play around with those. Um, this is one that I've been working on, scrum values. So, can anyone help me identify what these scrum values are? Which one do you think is openness? This, this one here? Okay, um, I'll put it there for now, but this is helping me because then maybe I'm not portraying myself w with what I intended. Can't remember if there's two ends or one. Um, what about focus? The first one, yeah, so that's focus. Courage? The second one, yeah, yeah. Um, what's the other one that I'm missing? Uh, commitment. The checklist, yep, commitment. Ugh. Definitely not spelling that one right. Um, and then respect. Do you think it's the last one? Yeah, this one? So I actually intended this one to be respect and this one to be openness. But you can see how it's easy to interchange them. So for me, it's much more beneficial if I actually wrote the words underneath it, right? So that's where it, it, you know, even though we're saying that the focus is on the visual portion of it, we still want to put in words sometimes because it can really get the idea across and avoid confusion. And this is a prime example, but it's fantastic feedback for me as well. All right, so that's everything that I have. Um, what I would like to ask you though is, if it clicks, whoops. Stand up if you know you can draw. Yeah, and I would actually give you guys a round of applause as well because each and every one of us can draw.
And the reason why I will say that is if you just think back to when we were uh, a child, okay, from a very, very early years when we started scribbling and drawing those stick figures and, and we went to school and we kind of expanded it on them and started putting bodies and fingers and hair. We've gone through that process. What happened was when we got to around age maybe 10-ish, maybe 9, nine to 10, the emphasis was put more on reading and writing, okay, um, and then perfecting our drawing. So almost kind of building a mental block, we stopped drawing thinking that it wasn't perfect, it wasn't like, you know, I won't say the Mona Lisa, but it definitely wasn't as perfect as we thought we could draw. For those of us who pursued and paid attention to it, obviously they moved on and excelled, but for most of us, you know, who stopped kind of doodling and drawing and expanding on that, we just thought, hey, we can't draw, so we stop, right? Um, and then we focus more on language, which is why then we, we get better at reading and writing and then our... our artistic skills kind of fall behind. Uh, what I would say is keep using them. These are really impactful images, in my opinion. Um, and we all have it um, within us to be able to do this. Again, basic shapes, that's, that's the key, that's the secret, I think. And um, yeah, that's everything I have. So thank you, guys. Um, I think ultimately, we had a very successful workshop if everyone stood up. So for me, I'm really, really happy. Um, I had to put this slide in, so thank you for our sponsors um, who made this possible. And this is me if you want to connect, so feel free to, um, you know, sync up with me, be happy to connect with anyone. All right, thank you guys.